All right. Well, what a privilege. What a joy to be here. Thank you, Pastor Herbert. And uh, just love People's Church. So good to uh, to be able to gather with you today. And uh, Pastor Herbert and I did have a lot of fun uh, last night just talking through life and talking about things that matter and that are important. But, but here's one of the things that I love about your pastor is even as we're talking, he got a text message from somebody who uh, he had been praying for and been communicating with with about some spiritual progress that they were making in their life. And he was so excited to tell me what God was doing in that individual's life. And then, you know, a little while later, we climbed in his car and he got another message about somebody and what God was doing in their life. And he was celebrating that for them and so excited to tell me about it. And I, it's just so refreshing to see pastors who love people and serve people and whose hearts are all in for their people. And that's Pastor Herbert Cooper. That's his wife, Tiffany. And you're very blessed to have a leader like that here at People's Church. Well, I'm honored to be with you. And um, I wonder, like, have you ever thought about just how people have selective memory? You know, they just, they kind of edit some things in their, in what they remember and what they recall. I know in my own life, my, my kids do this. They have, they have selective memory. Um, my kids, my wife and I, you know, they're, they're grown now. My son's uh, 17. My, my um, daughter is 20. But when we were raising them, every night we would take turns on putting the kids to bed. Some of you are living this right now. And then putting the kids to bed was a big deal around our house. It was like a two-hour thing, man. It was an ordeal. Like you go in and first we'd have to brush the teeth, right? And all the kids would brush their teeth and do all the things. And then after they brush their teeth, eventually, you know, I get them all changed in their jammies. And once they're all changed in their jammies, we'd go in and, and uh, I'd read them a Bible story individually. Lori made me do it individually. I want to do the group thing. She wants to do it individually. Okay. Then I pray over them and tuck them in bed and say good night. Except my son Ethan, he he couldn't sleep. He's always getting up. He's always moving around. And so you'd have to sit outside the door for anywhere from forty five minutes to an hour plus until he finally fell asleep. Because as soon as you leave, he would like no, and he would get up and he'd be all over the place. He's just a little kid. Now, I did this hundreds of times, hundreds of times. I lovingly went upstairs. I lovingly tucked those kids uh, into, um, into bed. I lovingly read a story. I prayed a blessing over them. I did this again and again and again and again. But if you ask my kids about all the times I put them to bed at night, they wouldn't remember any of those times. They would only remember one time. And it was the time I totally lost it. They were brushing their teeth. My daughter had a little Hello Kitty toothbrush, and she wasn't doing it. She was just kind of lollygagging around, and I've been trying to get them to brush their teeth. I've been trying to get them to focus, and I remember this moment where I just completely snapped, and I took Hello Kitty, and I chucked Hello Kitty into the sink. Yeah. Batteries flew out everywhere. My kids were, and I remember saying, you never listen to me. That's all my kids remember. In fact, my daughter walked in the room a while back, and her grandmother was standing there. And I said, let's just, just do a little test. She walked out and said, Emma, hey, you remember all the times I put you to bed as a kid? She goes, I remember that one time you threw the toothbrush. That's it. I mean, all the, all the times that I, that I took my kids to McDonald's, all the times that I let my uh, uh, son beat me at video games, all the talking dog movies, all the sacrifice at night, all of that is gone because of a toothbrush moment. I, I'm jaded. But here's the deal. Anger has a way of staying with us. Right? Anger has a way of sort of sticking uh, in our lives and in our minds. And sometimes when those moments of anger, we can kind of lose perspective. Sometimes we can get selective memory. And I wonder if some people do this with God as well. Sometimes you may be reading in the Bible and all of a sudden you come across a passage where like God gets angry, like you're in the Old Testament. And you're like, whoa, where's that? Like if God is for us stuff, man, because this is really hard. To, I don't know what happened there. And you're just trying to figure it out. 
A lot of people feel like God's angry all the time. In fact, it's kind of in the American religious DNA. You go all the way back to one of the most influential early sermons delivered in America that you can still read in certain literature classes today. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And a lot of people just feel like God is angry all the time. He's the big judge in the sky. He's just waiting to zap you. And it's frustrating. Some of you, you're trying to navigate your life. You're trying to close the gap between your dream and reality. You're trying to pass the test. You're trying to walk in faith. But sometimes when things aren't going your way, when things are taking too long, you can start to wonder, like, is God just mad at me? Is he just upset at me? Is he just angry at me? And if you were raised in a family where there's anger or there's abuse, where there's a lot more than chucking the toothbrush, then those things can mark you and you can project that onto God and how you view God in your life as well. I want to talk to you today about some good news. And that is that on your way to accomplishing your dream, God's patience will pave the road. In fact, God's patience paves the road to your future. God's patience paves the road to your dream. God's patience paves the road for you to walk in faith and trust and love. And it is his patience that can fill you with strength, even when you're in that in-between time and you're trying to close that gap. And to do that, I want to look at the Bible at a famous passage in the Old Testament. It's in Exodus chapter 34, and it's beginning in verse 6. Now, the interesting thing about Exodus 34, 6 is theologians like Tim Mackey and others will tell you that this passage we're about to look at is the most quoted passage in the Old Testament of the Bible by Old Testament writers. So we're about to look at the most quoted passage by the writers of the Psalms and the prophets and the history books and Proverbs and all the Old Testament. This is the passage that they alluded to more than any other. This is the passage that they quoted more than any other. In other words, this is like their John 316. You know, for God so loved the world, he, he sent his own son. Remember, you know, John, you see it at football games, people hold their you know. For the Old Testament believers, this was a core passage. Now, we don't talk about this passage that we're about to look at very much today, but this was a huge passage. And it's huge because it's where God introduces his character to his people in his own words. And God says, this is who I am. You're not just hearing it from a second-hand source. You're not just kind of trying to put it together. He said, I'm going to tell you, Moses, who I am. It's a pivotal time in Israel's history. God puts Moses in a, in a, in a cliff and, um, and hides him in the rock, and his glory passes in front of him. And God says some powerful words. I believe we have a slide that we're going to bring up that just has this verse on one side and these words that we're going to pull out on the other. Look at this, Exodus 34, 6. This is what God says about who he is. It says, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I'll just leave that up for a second. We we pulled out five different words um, that really capture what God says about himself. The first is the word compassion, and this is really cool. God introduces himself as a God of compassion, right? Then this was like revolutionary at the time. You know, like gods in the ancient Near East didn't describe themselves as compassionate. They would describe themselves as powerful, a winner, strong. God comes along and goes, hey. I'm filled with compassion. That's my first characteristic you need to know about. I care about the needs of my people. Secondly, he talks about mercy. It could be translated favor. God is a God who has favor on his people. Thirdly, his patience. We're going to look at his patience today. And then his loyal love, which is a covenant, an agreement kind of term in the Hebrew language. It gets to this, that God will love you, and that love isn't dependent on your performance. It's based on his own faithfulness to his promise and to himself. And then lastly, faithfulness, that God will never leave you or forsake you. This is who God himself 
himself says that he is. This is a word for somebody today because you have an image in your mind that God is the angry medieval God who wants to zap you and destroy you. Some of you aren't relating very well to God because you grew up in a home with anger and difficulty and abuse and you've projected that onto God. But listen, let's let God himself describe himself for us. And when God describes himself, he says, you need to know I'm compassionate, filled with favor, filled with patience and loyal love and faithfulness. That is who I am. Very next verse, Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 7, God says this. He expands on it. He says, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I don't excuse the guilty. So people, you know, we we read this verse, and a lot of people, when they see it, they kind of jump to that. I do not excuse the guilty. And then he goes on. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren The entire family is affected, even children in the third and the fourth generations. We read that and we're like, whoa, where's that Romans 8 stuff about God being for me? What am I supposed to do with that? And we focus on the latter part of that verse. A couple thoughts on that. One is, that's just a statement of reality, first of all. Have you ever noticed that that patterns of sin run often in families generationally. I mean, abuse often runs generationally in families. And when abuse happens in one generation, it trickles down and affects other generations. Other family members down line are affected by that sin. When addiction enters into a family, it has ramifications. It snowballs and it can affect other members of the family. Sin has consequences beyond our own lives. And in the context of a family, you see that that sin can be visited. And God says up to three and four generations can be impacted by that. But the second thing I want you to understand is that the original readers of this verse would not have focused on the latter part of the verse. That's where we always focus. They would have focused on the contrast. And the contrast is this. Don't miss it. God says, I bless my people to a thousand generations. A thousand generations. This is the the heart of God for you today in your life. I bless my people to a thousand generations. Oh, yes, And there are consequences for sin to the third and fourth generation. You see the contrast? It's the contrast that the Hebrew mind would have read and would have understood immediately. That's amazing. God's introducing himself as a God of faithfulness, compassion, favor, loyal love. He's pouring it all out. And then he says, and here's the deal. To a thousand generations, I bless my people. Listen, I want you to know when you make faith commitments, those of you that are part of the people's church family, when you walk in faith, when you pray, when you uh, uh, dedicate yourself, when you change the narrative of your family. It's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids and your kids' 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 kids. kids. It's going to affect a thousand generations will be blessed as you follow God because you follow a God who's filled with patience and love. And some of you right now are like, okay, pastor, that's good, but man, my family's a mess. My family's a mess. What do I do with that? See, the good news is it's not ironclad that the sin gets visited to the third and fourth generation. At any moment, you can turn to God, you can follow God, and you can break the chain, the chain that maybe has existed for multiple generations in your family. You can be the one to start following Christ and walking differently and allowing God to move and work in your life as you do. Listen, even when we lose patience, God doesn't lose patience with us. He is a patient and loving God. And as you're on your way to your dream, as you're on your way to following the purpose that God has created you for in your life, realize his patience is what paves the road for you to walk in faith. So a couple thoughts for you today. One is give thanks for God's patience. Give thanks for his patience. Um, I don't know if you have anybody in your house that... Uh, is constantly tweaking the thermostat. 
But in our house, my kids, they love to get on the thermostat and adjust it. It drives me crazy, especially when it's freezing cold and the air conditioner's on. Come on, somebody. The air conditioner's on. It's freezing out there. But my kid woke up, you know, at some point, and, oh, well, just turn the air conditioner on. We'll fix it right now. Drives me crazy. I saw this one slide on uh, social media, on Twitter. We'll bring it up here on the screen. I thought it was uh, pretty funny. Uh, guy says, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if the house is 73 and you want it to be 68, turning the thermostat down to 60 doesn't make it happen any quicker. Somebody needs to hear that right now. Somebody, but then he, then he says this. <laughs> he says, and by, I don't know who, I mean my wife, but I can't tell her because she's pregnant. And she scares me. Yes. Oh, man, I lose patience. I lose patience when it comes to the thermostat. There's a whole lot of things that can cause me to lose patience. But the Bible says that God is patient. Now, the, the Hebrew word for anger literally means hot-nosed. You know, which is kind of interesting. We, we call somebody like a hothead, right? If they're really angry sort of people. Uh, the Hebrews would have said, well, no, they're like hot nose. Have you ever noticed that when somebody gets really angry, their nostrils kind of flare? They, 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 they get flushed, right, in their face. So hot nose was the word for anger. But you know how you translate the phrase slow to anger? Long nosed. That's, that's literally how the Hebrew would read. God is long nosed. Not like Pinocchio. But long knows then that he is slow to get anger and to, to get angry. Now there are moments where God gets angry. And you see it overflow in the pages of the Bible. He gets angry with his people. He visits judgment on his people or discipline on his people and, and judgment on the surrounding nations. And, you know, you see this happen and, and you, 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 you know, kind of you watch it unfold. And the truth is, like, we don't want a God who never gets angry. Because if he never gets angry, then he doesn't really value justice. Right? If he never gets angry, then, then there are things in our world that should make us angry that don't make him angry. Right, And so God values justice, but his heart, the core of who he is, is to be long-nosed, is to be patient. God has a very, very long fuse with you and with me in our lives. And every day we can give thanks for that. One of the stories that jumped out at me in the Old Testament is in the book of Jonah. Some of you might remember the story of Jonah, but Jonah was a guy that, that was a prophet. He was called by God to go to the city of Nineveh, the city of people that were not necessarily religious. The Ninevites were known historically to be especially brutal. And um, so he was called to go and deliver the message of God to the people of Nineveh. And he ran from God. He wouldn't do it. And then, you know, he gets thrown overboard on a ship. He gets swallowed by a whale. He gets spit up. And eventually he agrees to go. And a lot of times we think of Jonah and we think, well, Jonah ran from God because, you know, he didn't want to do what God called him to do. He's like he would, he would be, he was afraid that if he did what God called him to do, he would fail. But that's really not the meaning of the story of Jonah at all. Listen to what Jonah says in his own words, Jonah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Basically, he preaches to the Ninevites, and when he does, the Ninevites turn to God, and God chooses not to, to destroy them. God relents, and here's what the Bible says. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry, hot-nosed. So he complained to the Lord about it. Look at this. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? Look, this is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew, I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You see what that is? That's a quote. That's an allusion to Exodus 34, 6. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Jonah's upset because God didn't destroy the Ninevites. And he's like, I knew he wouldn't do it. I'd roll in there and tell them about God and challenge them to turn to him. And the people would turn to him. And then God, slow to get angry, compassionate, ah, and Jonah's like, and now I look like an idiot. That's the subtext, right? I told him this was going to happen, and now it's not. Jonah's angry and upset because God didn't destroy the Ninevites. That's the story of Jonah. And the book ends with this imbalance hanging, the tension. 
And God says something very powerful to Jonah. He says, should I not show mercy to this great city? That's the heart of God. The heart of God wants to show mercy to our cities. The heart of God wants to show mercy to you and to your families. You don't have to earn it. You, don't have to, you just need to know he's ready to give it. That's what his heart is. And Jonah's angry because God didn't destroy his enemies. You ever wanted God to like show up and bring it down on your enemies? You know what I'm saying? On your ex? On, you know, pick the team. Right, you, you ever in your life just kind of been like, come on, God, you ever watch the news and been like, God, just, just do it, man. Just bring it down. Just, just go. That's not right. That needs to be dealt with. But here's the thing. When we look at others, sometimes we want God to like rush his judgment. When we look at others, we can get impatient. But when we look in our own hearts, <laughs> that's when a different story gets told. You look in your own hearts, you give thanks. God, I'm grateful that you're patient. And, I, you know, unfortunately, you're patient with them as well. But I'm thankful that you're also patient with me. Right, I'm thankful that you're long-nosed. I'm thankful that you're slow to get angry. I'm grateful for your patience. Think about this. God was patient with you. He was patient with you when you spoke about somebody that you had no business speaking about. He was patient with you when you gossiped about somebody you had no business gossiping about. He was patient with you when you lied a little bit and kind of, you know, fudged on the truth. He was patient with you when you lusted after somebody you should not have been lusting after. He was patient with you when you broke every one of his commands and walked in your own way and rebelled against him again and again and again. He was patient with you when you were lost in your addiction, when you were lost in your selfishness, when you were lost in yourself. He was patient with you when you looked everywhere else but to him. You looked to people, you looked to money, you looked to fame, you looked to Instagram, you looked at everything but God, and you tried to find hope and meaning in everything but God, and God was still patient with you. Give thanks for his patience. Give praise for for his patience. He's a long suffering, patient God. And every day we're drawn in there is because of his goodness and his patience in our lives. Give thanks. Every day I can wake up and I don't know what's coming. I don't know if there's going to be crazy snow on the ground. Hello. Or, or not so much. I don't know if things are going to go my way or things are going to go another way altogether, but I know that no matter what I face, I can give thanks because, listen, God doesn't owe me anything. He's already done more for me than I could ever ask for or imagine. I don't even have to. I believe God will bless us in the future, but I don't even have If God doesn't do another thing for me, he's already done more than I could ever dare ask or imagine in Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. And every day he is patient with me. I'm thankful for that patience. Give thanks for it. Second thought is this. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. You know, when I was a kid growing up with a name like Judd, man, I, uh, I had a lot of nicknames. Uh, Judd the Dud. Um, Judd the Mud. Uh, poor old Judd is dead. I don't know if anybody even know that's, that, that's from Oklahoma, just saying. And so I had a lot of nicknames and others, weird, hello. That stayed with me. But none of those names were as bad as the names I said to myself. Stupid Judd, ugly Judd, angry Judd, toothbrush chucking, bad pastor Judd. And the truth is, those things are true of me. But it's not the whole story. I may be a mess, right? But I'm God's mess. I may be a sinner, but I am a saint through what Jesus Christ has done for me. I may be kind of not perfected, but I'm on the journey and God is moving in my life. And as I receive that, I can not only give thanks for his patience, I can be patient with myself. I can be patient with myself. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. This is such a great word for us. It says this, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. 
Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. That's a great word for us today, that we are to encourage one another because of all that God has done for us and the way he's moved and worked in our lives. And I think sometimes when it comes to spiritual growth in our lives, we, um, we see spiritual growth like it, like it should be a direct line. We think we should get saved, and then we should, we should be changed. We think, you know, we should come to faith in Christ, and then all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we begin to grow, and, and everything just sort of transforms. It kind of looks like, like this image. We'll just bring it up here on the screen. Uh, we start with saved. We move directly to change. Man, it's awesome. I came to faith in Christ, and I don't cuss anymore when I stump my toe, and I don't lose my cool anymore, and I got it all together now, and I'm just like, I got, I'm changed. And that's what we think the spiritual life should look like. But this next slide is really what the spiritual life looks like. That's the real picture. And it's messy. And it's a couple steps forward and then a step or two back. And then a few more steps forward and a few more steps back. And when you realize that, you begin to give grace to others and to yourself. Because we're all on the messy journey. But we're on the journey. And I think it often goes like this. When you first come to faith, it's all about God. Look what God did. It's amazing. You're learning new things. God worked. God moved. God's incredible. The challenge is shortly thereafter, we shift to another phase in the spiritual journey. And we often shift to the phase where it's all about me. What I need to do. I need to attend church. I need to tithe. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to evangelize. I need to share my faith. I need to, and all these things that we need to do. And those are important things to do, not to earn God's love, but because we have God's love. But sometimes we get that flipped around and we start to make it all about us. And we think we've got to be better and better and better. And we, we have no patience for ourselves and our failings. And here's what'll happen. You'll either quit and give up on that journey, or you'll finally come to the place, what I would call the third place of spiritual growth. You go from all God to all me, to all grace. And you realize every Everything I have is a gift of God. Look, I, you know, I just show up and God moves and God works and God blesses and it's about God. It's not about me. And so I can be patient with myself and I can be patient with others on the spiritual journey. I can trust that God is moving and working even in the midst of that situation in my life. It's about him. And so Thessalonians says, encourage one another. With these words. Now, I pastor a church in, in Las Vegas. And um, first of all, I guess I should just say there are Christians and churches in Las Vegas. Okay, that's, you know, I'll just clear that up for those of you who are wondering. Yes, there are. And there are uh, some great churches and some great people of faith, just like any other city. But I remember once I was, I was out um, somewhere in the community and somebody didn't know that I was a pastor at our church and they had heard a little bit about our church, but they didn't really know it. And uh, this person said, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard about that church. He, they said, um, that's just the big, that's just the big feel good church. And I remember at first I was kind of offended and I thought about it for a minute and I'm like, well, it could have been worse. <laughs> it could have been the angry church. It could have been the Mm, fill in the blank, right? Could have been the judgmental church. Could have been the depressed church. Could have been the sleepy church. And then I started thinking about who God is. He's filled with compassion and favor and patience and loyal love and faithfulness. I don't know about you, but that feels pretty good to me. And so now I've just kind of embraced it. Because look, we're out, sin is sin, and we got to call sin, sin, and we don't need to beat around the bush about that. But the overarching character of God and the arc of the Bible is this. God loves people. God has patience with people, and God wants to see people redeemed and restored, and that's who he is. That's what drives him. So, friends, we face a choice in our families and in our lives. Are we going to be the kind of people that experience God's blessing to a thousand generations? Or are we gonna allow sin to creep in and destroy and have an impact to three or four generations? We can choose. I'll tell you a story about a little girl that I heard. This little girl grew up in a home filled with a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulty. Around the age of five, six, she learned to drive 
because her dad was an alcoholic. And there were times when he was too drunk to drive, but to get home, he would have his daughter sit in his lap and she would steer and she would tell him when to push the gas and when to push the brake. Her mother had come from a home filled with all kinds of difficulties and just found it kind of impossible to show affection and love. That was the home she came from. Heard a story about a little boy. He was raised in a home where parents went to church and everything looked like it was cool on the outside, but behind closed doors, there was generational history with mental health, depression kinds of issues that were undiagnosed, untalked about in that time, that era. He got called back from Vietnam shortly after uh, being drafted because his father had taken his own life, committed suicide. And he came back to take care of the family. And that was when he learned actually for the first time that not only had his father killed himself, but his father's father had killed himself as well. So a family marked by depression and suicide. And that little girl and that little boy met and they fell in love. And they decided, you know what? We're not going to pass on the legacy of what we inherited. Not the bad, not the abuse, not the addiction, not the pain. They got involved in their local church. They committed their lives to Jesus Christ. They began to walk in faith in a transparent, real way. And they said, we're not, we are going to break the chain. We love our parents. We honor our parents. But, it, but some of those behaviors stop at our front door. We're going to walk in faith. And as they began to walk in faith, God began to move and work. And I'm a direct benefit of that because I had a little girl named Lori, who would later become my wife, who's amazing and has influenced so many women for Christ and his kingdom and my own life and our family's life and our church's life. They had a little boy named Sean who actually went on to become um, a pastor, making a huge difference in the Chicagoland area right now. But it's all because two people said, look, we're going to break the chain. We're not going to pass on what we inherited. And I, this is for somebody today. You just need to hear this. What you inherited does not define who you are. What you came from doesn't define where you're going to go. I don't know what your parents did. I don't know where they came from. But that doesn't define who you are and where you are going. You can break the chain of addiction. You can break the chain of abuse. You can break the chain of poverty. You can break the chain of selfishness. You can break the chain chain of greed. You can begin to walk in faith in your life. It won't be overnight, but if you stay the course on the long direction, you're going to see God bless not only your life, but your kids' lives and your grandkids' lives and your great-grandkids' lives. And you can honor your family, but you can say, I'm breaking the chain today. I'm not passing on what I received because I have a God that's long nose. <laughs> I not like Pinocchio. I have a God that's patient. I have a God that's faithful and he's loyal and he's compassionate and he will honor his word to me. Listen, you're not perfect, but you're on the way. You're still a sinner, but you're saved by God's glorious grace. You don't have it all figured out, but you follow the one who does. You may not even know where you're going, but God's spirit within you will lead you and guide you all the way home. You're protected. You're covered. You are empowered. God loves you and is working in your life. As somebody today, geez, you're right there. You're right there. You just got to reach out and believe it. You got to believe it. And don't take my word for it. It's God's word that you got to take. This is how God describes himself. Exodus 34. And he's there for you, just like he's been there for me. Doesn't matter where you come from. Matters who you're following on the way to where he's leading you to go. And if you want to close that gap between your dream and the reality God's calling you to, lean on his patience, lean on his compassion, his favor, his loyal love, his faithfulness. He will see you through and his patience will pave the way. 
Let's bow. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for how you move and work in our lives. We thank you for the kindness and mercy that you show us every day. We thank you for your word. God, we pray today that we could just be inspired again by who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. And I pray for somebody out there who's hurting, who knows they've blown it or messed up, who feels like you've abandoned them or left them, that God, you will reach out today and touch them in a powerful way and let them know you're still present in their life. You still love them. You're working. You're patient and long suffering. God, we thank you for the goodness and the patience that you show to us every day. We thank you for the way you bless us as we follow you. We pray you'll bless our kids and our grandkids and their kids to a thousand generations and beyond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.